This is not a shots fired thing. Like, Mike's gonna rip Bart Ehrman apart. I'm gonna rip you in half now. And I'm gonna play clips of Bart Ehrman for you. And I wanna show you how they're absolutely, inarguably, demonstrably false and misleading. Okay, well, if there's nobody, nothing to argue with, then I guess he's right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> if you can't argue otherwise. If you respect Dr. Bart Ehrman, and he's brilliant. The guy's brilliant. And he's done a lot of smart things. Would it help you to know that Jim thinks you're smart? No. I'm not trying to be condescending here. <laughs> That's nice. Okay. Laura, we lift up our uh, our family and friends right now who are perhaps being uh, influenced by maybe Bart Ehrman or maybe just those who are quoting his material that people would, would look at the actual word of God themselves and not see it through the filter of Bart Ehrman. Wow. Okay. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians, along with friend of the channel, renowned scholar, Dr. Bart Ehrman. You would just think, well, Bart Ehrman knows his stuff. He's a scholar. The guy's got like millions and millions of book sales. He's very highly regarded and, um, and right. This, this, this is a guy I should trust. Who has a course on the book of Mark coming up. This is an eight lecture course on one of the most important pieces of literature in our civilization that nobody, no, almost very few people really understand what's going in the gospel of Mark. I call it the unknown Jesus because my point in this course is to show why Mark is Mark and he's not something else. He is not giving the message that John is giving or that Luke is giving or Matthew. And, and the thing about Mark is that Mark is trying to emphasize that Jesus is this Messiah and nobody understood it. We'll get to more on that later because on the topic of Mark, today we're going to be looking at a video from Pastor Mike Winger. So are you going to go into battle dressed as a cool youth pastor? A video that has received over 400,000 views called How an Atheist Scholar Misleads Millions of People, the Mark Series. <laughs> and that atheist scholar is you, Dr. Ehrman. What? So for numerous reasons, Dr. Bart Ehrman is incredibly misleading to people. And that's sad. That's very sad. And hopefully this kind of video is going to help fix that. So Dr. Bart Ehrman, the uh, kind of the subject of today's study in the Gospel of Mark, for the most part, he's radically distorting Mark. I mean, radically, horribly distorting Mark, ignoring Mark entirely uh, to construct a false contradiction here that has is, is misleading and convincing to millions of people. Here we go. This is the clip. And the mistake people make is pretending that what Mark has to say is the same thing that Luke has to say. And that what Luke has to say is the same thing that Mark has to say. These are two different gospels with two different points of view. And if you smash them together into one kind of mega gospel, you have ruined the emphasis of each one. Sometimes there are differences in emphases that really matter. I'll give you one example. Mark has a very powerful portrayal of Jesus going to his death. Jesus has been uh, betrayed by one of his followers. He's turned over to Pontius Pilate, and during his trial, Jesus doesn't say anything to Pontius Pilate, except Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, su leges, you say so. That's all he says. This section, these five verses, is what Bart Ehrman's referring to when he says that Jesus says nothing before Pilate except the phrase, you say so. <laughs> I, I don't see how one can debate that Jesus doesn't say much. <laughs> In his trial, he says two words, su leges. <laughs> the entire trial. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think it's pretty safe to say he didn't say much. <laughs> He's taken out to be crucified. He doesn't say anything. He's got, he goes to the place of crucifixion. He's silent the entire way. They nail him to the cross, and he's silent. So Dr. Ehrman wants us to think that Mark is saying the words he records that Jesus says are the only words Jesus Jesus says. Then it creates conflict with Luke because if you go to another gospel, say Luke, John, and it has Jesus saying something during the discussion with Pilate more than you say so, if Jesus says something, then now it's a conflict, right? Now there's a contradiction between these things. But Mark doesn't actually say this. Mark never in, in this whole passage in the many hours of the day, it never says the only thing Jesus said during this three hours was this one phrase. And Jesus, it's true, he doesn't say anything in Mark's gospel. But there's a difference between Jesus doesn't say anything and Mark has Jesus saying nothing. These are very different things. Because in the same sense Jesus doesn't say anything, I could say that Jesus doesn't breathe. In fact, nobody breathes in the entire gospel of Mark. Have you ever noticed this? But nobody breathed as far as Mark wants to emphasize that nobody breathed in the first century because he never mentions anybody breathing. Huh, that's a confusion of categories. When I'm talking about the gospel of Mark, 
I'm talking about the Gospel of Mark. If I say, look, in the New York Times today, it said that Joseph Biden yesterday said X. The New York Times author is not assuming that that's the only thing Biden said yesterday. <laughs> if you're going to study any piece of literature, the way you study a piece of literature is by seeing what it says. You don't study the piece of literature by hypothesizing what it could have said. <laughs> and so he's confusing things. I'm not talking about the historical Jesus. I'm not talking about what happened at Jesus' trial when I'm talking about Mark. I'm talking about Mark, what Mark's portrayal is. And it's important if you want to know how Mark is trying to portray Jesus, then you need to see what Mark says and not pretend he says something else. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I don't get that. I get it. I certainly get it. But I think it's a little bit weird. Here's the problem. If you read Mark carefully, you find that, and this is consistent with Luke as well, Jesus isn't uh, being portrayed as saying nothing at all. He's being portrayed as saying nothing in his defense in a criminal case. There's a difference between being utterly silent and not giving a defense. That's how Mark presents Jesus. Yes, I think it probably is that. And it's, it's interesting, actually, because Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And this is an extremely interesting passage. And, you know, you ruin so much of it when you just try to figure out, well, what really happened. I'm really interested in what really happened. But if you want to understand Mark, what is Mark doing here? Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, you say so. So as I said in Greek, it's su leges. And it's completely ambiguous. Does he mean yes? Does he mean no? Does he mean maybe? Does he mean those are your words, not mine? Why doesn't he give a direct answer? Okay, it's a very, very good question, and that's where interpretation comes in. You blow the question out of the water if you said, well, he said a lot of other things too. And so actually what he said was, and you come up with it, then you miss the point <laughs> that Mark is trying to make a point about Jesus saying just that. And you have to put it in the context of then what happens for the next verses in chapter to figure out how, what Mark's trying to tell you. If you don't figure out what Mark's trying to tell you, you might as well read Matthew. Don't read Mark, just read something else. <laughs> uh, Jesus gets it. He's the only one who does. It's everybody else that doesn't get it. Barney Ehrman puts that attitude on Jesus and ignores so much, so much of what is actually in the gospel. That conclusion I hope I've demonstrated is, for Mark is utterly fallacious. Like this is super wrong. Uh, Dr. Ehrman has projected the attitude of Peter in Mark's gospel onto Jesus in Mark's gospel. Peter is the one who doesn't know what's going on. Peter's the one who wouldn't believe that the cross was going to happen and didn't believe that it had a purpose when it started to happen. That's Peter. Peter later changes his mind, later becomes a, you know, a whole different perspective. But during that time, Peter's the guy that doesn't get it. Peter's the guy that's confused. Peter's the guy who is in despair and shock. Jesus is not. What Mike is referring to is when you read through Mark's gospel, Jesus regularly says that he's going to be executed and raised from the dead. There are three passages that are called passion predictions where he predicts that's going to happen. Jesus in Mark 9.31 predicts his betrayal, his death, and his resurrection. Mark 14.24, again in Mark 10.45. And so you pretty well know that Jesus knows this is going to happen to him. But what the interesting thing that I do point out that I think is what he's objecting to is that when it comes to the moment, Jesus seems to be in doubt. You get the idea of Jesus being in shock at what's happening to him. And I think Mike is saying, look, it doesn't make any sense because he, he knows all the way through. So of course he's not in doubt at the end. That's his objection to me. That could be a valid point, but you need to read what Mark says. So Jesus gets put on trial of Pontius Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? You say so. That's all he says. He goes out to the place of crucifixion. He doesn't say anything to anyone. He gets nailed to the cross, doesn't say anything to anyone. He's all hanging on the cross, doesn't say anything at all. In the other gospels, he says things, but in Mark, he doesn't say anything until the very end. The only thing he does, the only thing he says is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So his disciples have all abandoned him. One of them has denied him. One of them has betrayed him. Everybody walking by him is mocking him. Both robbers are mocking him. And at the very end, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he dies. And so Mike Winger will want to say, well, yes, he didn't really mean that. I think there's a better theory. Jesus is thinking of the entire Psalm, right? Verse one included, I'm, yeah, I'm being forsaken, but he's also thinking of the entire Psalm, Psalm 22, which includes detailed descriptions of the cross, right? Specific events, as well as his death, as well as his future hope, as well as the gospel going out to the world and people getting saved, all of the above. What he meant was that he's quoting one of the Psalms, and at the end of the Psalm, after the person starts by saying, why have you forsaken me? At the end of the Psalm, the Psalmist thanks God for being on his side, 
And so Jesus doesn't mean what he says. He meant what was going to be at the end of the psalm instead of the part he quoted. So if Psalm 22 is what Jesus is referring to, then it not only includes his death, it includes hope and resurrection and future and, and salvation going to the world. Okay, all of that's included in this cry. But Barnum doesn't want you to think that. Okay, so yeah, that's what people say. And it's a complete misreading of Mark. Because if Mark wanted you to think that Jesus felt God was on his side, he would have quoted the end of the psalm. <laughs> He's asking God why he has forsaken him, and he dies in despair. The only reason to think he didn't die in despair is because you're reading the other Gospels instead of Mark, and because you have your personal beliefs about the matter. But read Mark, and Mark doesn't have that view. And if you don't see that, you compl boy, do you miss the point. Because right after Jesus says that, why have you forsaken me? And he dies. He dies not knowing. The reader knows. Because the very next thing is, the curtain in the temple rips in half. This is the curtain that separates the Holy of Holies, where God dwells, from the rest of the temple. Now, God is not separated from anybody else the, the way he had been. Now he's available to everybody because of Jesus' death. And the very next thing that happens in the next breath is the centurion sees how Jesus dies, and he says, truly, this man was the Son of God. In other words, Jesus' death gives you access to God because it's the death of the Messiah, the Son of God, and that's Mark's point. So that even though Jesus dies not knowing what's going on, the reader absolutely knows. And he sees, yep, okay, that's it. That's why he had to die. Because Mark is definitely thinking of the whole psalm. Let me prove it to you. Okay, Psalm 22, 18. Um, this verse might sound familiar if you read Mark's gospel. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This is one of the many verses Mark alludes to. This is in Mark 15, 24. They crucified and divided his garments among, them, among themselves, casting lots for them. You see, Mark is actually alluding to Psalm 22, verse 18, not just verse 1, in his account of Jesus in Mark 15. No, I think what's happening is that Mark, like other people at his time, around about 40 years after Jesus' death, had found passages in Scripture that, that they used to show that Jesus is fulfilling what was predicted in the Scriptures. And so the fact he's crucified by two criminals on either side of him, and the fact that he's buried by a rich man, there are all of these allusions to biblical passages and, you know, Isaiah 53. And so when Christians centered in on those things, they started seeing that you could tell the story of Jesus in a way that showed that it's like what was being said in the Psalms or in Isaiah. And so they weren't thinking about these texts the way we think of them. If we think about Psalm 22, for example, or Isaiah 53, we have ways that we interpret these texts as wholes. You know, we think of them as having integrity as a whole text. And so Psalm 22 is its own unit. And so we think of the whole unit as being one thing. Isaiah 53 is part of Second Isaiah from chapters 40 to 55. And so scholars interpret that as a unit. But the early Christians weren't doing it that way. And neither were the rabbis, by the way. The rabbis typically would take a verse here and a verse there and show how they're related to each other in ways that we might not even think about, but they'd be disparate all over the place. And so the literary unity that we think about isn't normally how people were reading these texts. And so the fact that he quotes Psalm 22 in a couple of different ways, several different ways, and alludes to it, or Isaiah 53 or whatever, doesn't mean that he's reading it from beginning to end, thinking that the whole thing applies. Again, Bart Ehrman is claiming that Mark's intention is that you only think of verse one in Psalm 22. But did you know that it was normal rabbinical like teaching practice to refer to a passage of scripture with the title uh, or the, the first verse of that scripture? So the reason for this is that back in the day, they didn't have chapters and verses. So no Jew in the first century ever said the phrase Psalm 22. This is not saying that because they don't, they don't use those terms. They would refer to like, the um the psalm the my god my god why have you forsaken me psalm and rabbis would refer to the first part of a passage the first verse or the first phrase in a passage as a way of getting their students to think of the whole passage that was normal teaching habits we even see it in the talmud they do this they like quote the first phrase to refer to the whole passage let's put it this way today we have literary theorists say you know 20 years ago we had a deconstructionist who are literary critics who had various ways of interpreting literature that would say that was happening in the 1980s. Would you say that a tradition of literary theory in the 1980s was relevant in the 1730s? So the rabbinic tradition is much later than the New Testament, 
And so it doesn't work to say, well, rabbis say this <laughs> on the assumption, well, you know, it's, it's all a long time ago. <laughs> so it's all the same thing. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, you know, literary theory today isn't the same as it was in the early 18th century. And rabbinic theories of interpretation varied over time. And so whatever you say about Mark quoting a rabbi <laughs> living hundreds of years later, the Talmud, I'm not sure which part of the rabbinic, he probably hasn't read any of the rabbinic literature himself, but you know the Mishnah was codified around the year 200, and the Talmud, which is where most of the rabbinic stuff comes from, that's f fifth century. <laughs> I mean, we're, so yeah. It's about what Mark is saying about Jesus, what Luke is saying about Jesus, and how they're they're very different. And the obvious implication is that they are irreconcilably contradictory. How would this impact you if if you were the student and he's your professor in college? And he's like the smartest guy you've ever met, right? And you're you're sitting there and he says all this, and you're sitting there thinking, ah, oh, oh man, I I I mean, I I don't know. I guess I guess maybe he's right. Like, oh gosh, oh no. Maybe you listen and you go, yes, I knew it. I knew that the gospels were all contradictory and nonsense. I thought that the gospels each had a distinctive point when I was an evangelical Christian, and it wasn't because I wanted to point out contradictions. Is because I thought that there were four gospels in the New Testament and not one gospel, and each of these is a book written by a particular author. Even if you believe that God inspired each author, he inspired four different authors, and presumably that's because they have four different things to say. And if you pretend that they all mean the same thing, then you don't have any explanation for why there are four of them. <laughs> you just write one of them. And of course, throughout the history of Christianity, that has been, that's been the view. And even in the second Christian century, there was an author named Tatian who created this thing called the Diatessaron which was a, a diatessaron means through the four. And what he did is he took the four gospels and he combined them into one big gospel. And so he'd take verses from Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, and they put them all together so that the same story would be longer because it'd have everything in it, but there weren't contradictions now because it was just, it was all there. And that was the gospel used in Syria for centuries rather than the four individual gospels, the use of the diatessaron. And scholars today say, well, yeah, no, that's an interesting enterprise. But when you do that, then you're not really trying to understand what Matthew, for example, is trying to teach or seeing how it's different from John. The result of seeing them is different. Is It's true. You do find contradictions there, but that's not the reason for doing it. The reason for doing it is because you want to see what an author says. When I read Charles Dickens, I just don't assume he's saying the same thing as George Eliot, <laughs> you know, or that Mark Twain is saying the same thing as T.S. Eliot. I mean, it's like you don't, you let each author have his own say. And if it turns out they contradict each other, that's worth noting. But that's not why you're doing it. You're doing it to see what an author has to say. This is a place that is targeted by Bart Ehrman to mislead people, in my opinion. He may have turned more Christians into atheists than anybody else alive today. His content that's very persuasive, that is convincing lots of people to depart from the Christian faith, for the most part, he's radically distorting Mark. I mean, radically, horribly distorting Mark, ignoring Mark entirely uh, to construct a false contradiction here that has is, is misleading and convincing to millions of people. Like, like, obviously, this is not Mark's emphasis. That's Ehrman's emphasis, not Mark. Okay, this is nothing to do with the gospel of Mark. This is all about misleading people about the word of God, sadly. No, to think it is is rather insulting to me. I, I do not attack Christianity at all. I don't ever try to deconvert anybody. I never try to deconvert any of my students or to convert them to my points of view. My view is that if somebody's a Christian, that's great. Why not? I think, I mean, I'm not, but I have no problem with people being a Christian, but I would, I think that it's better to be an informed Christian and to have knowledge about the past and knowledge about the Bible. The opposite of an informed Christian is an ignorant Christian. And why would you want to be an ignorant Christian? And so this kind of historical knowledge doesn't make somebody a non-Christian. These views that I have of the Gospels, I had for years while I was still a Christian, a church-going, Sunday school-teaching Christian. And so it, I may not have been a fundamentalist, but I certainly was a Christian. And so to say that you can't hold these things and be a Christian is just ignorant. And so, I, again, I don't, know, I don't know Mike Winger, and I don't know why he'd be attacking me like this, but you know, I have a pretty good suspicion, because when I was a fundamentalist, I probably would have been attacking me too. <laughs> but it's, it's better not to be a fundamentalist. Okay, well, is this upcoming Mark course equally valuable for Christians and non-Christians as well? Oh, yeah. No, no. The point of this course is not to, like, 
make somebody, like to deconvert somebody. This is to provide information. And this information is, anybody can check out this information. I'll be talking about what Mark says. And you can disagree with everything in it, but I mean, it'd be ridiculous to reject something you haven't even heard yet. And so I'm really interested in knowing Mark's point of view. If Mark is presenting a story about Jesus, and it's important to give Mark his own integrity. You know, when Mike Winger writes a book, which I assume he does, it would not really do him justice to say that he's saying the same thing as Bart Ehrman says in one of his books. <laughs> we are different authors. And even if you have two scholars writing something, you should read what each one says, because one might be saying something different. So that's, why, that's how I treat the Gospels. I just want to know what Mark says and what it probably means. Mark is my favorite gospel. This is not, of course, driven by hate. I love the gospel of Mark. It is my favorite book of the Bible, one of my favorite. I, I think it's fantastic. And I think most people completely misunderstand it because they simply assume it's like a condensed version of Matthew or something. And so they don't even bother seeing what its distinctive emphases are. But when you see them, you realize this is a work of genius. And that's what I'll be talking about. Excellent. To enroll now in this eight-lecture course from the world-class scholar, Dr. Bart Ehrman, check it out at tinyurl.com slash bartmark, B-A-R-T-M-A-R-K. To learn more, and if you order from that link, you'll also be helping this channel, which I greatly appreciate. Thanks as always, Dr. Ehrman, for coming on and clearing things up. Thanks, Paul. See ya. For another Team Up with Bart, tap on the link on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Until next time... Later.